want to thank you for being here today. Over the last few weeks, we've been talking about different functions of our faith and what God can do within our life. And some of the things that we've talked about, we've tried to apply. But uh, today is one of those topics that is so valuable to us and so important that if we miss this particular point, we have lost our power. And the point is just prayer. The power of prayer is overwhelming. When we think about what God can do for us and what he can do through us, we can't do anything without the power of prayer. Now, I totally understand that prayer is not a natural thing. Uh, over the last few years, when I talk to people about their spiritual faith, one of the things they struggle with is prayer. They talk about prayer and they learn about prayer, but to actually pray is very struggling. You know, I truly believe there's only three people that did not struggle with prayer that's in the Bible. And the first one, of course, is Jesus, because he could pray and he, he understood who God was. And then Adam and Eve, because Adam and Eve walked with God. But something took place in the communion with God in the garden, when sin entered into the garden, that communication broke between man and God. So our prayer life struggles because sometimes we want to pray and sometimes we want God to work within our life, but the flesh and the sin within our life sometimes keeps us from actually praying. Sometimes it's very difficult. But Jesus now in Luke chapter 11 he just gave us the model prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power and the glory forever. Amen. And then he goes, he starts giving us a, an illustration he said, he talks about in Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 13, right after that model prayer, he talks about a man and persistence and boldness in his prayer. Sometimes we, we pray and we, we hope God is listening and we hope God will answer our prayer and, and we, we want him to do certain things. So we ask, but yet we do not have faith. And sometimes we do not even know how to pray. Sometimes we don't even know when to pray. Sometimes we can pray in the bed, but if we had to go to the hospital room and talk to somebody, you would say, ah, that's not me. Or a pastor would call on you to pray in church, you would say, oh, no, 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 not me. But that's not what the prayer is talking about. The prayer that Jesus is talking about is a heartfelt prayer, a persistent prayer within your heart. See, I truly believe that sometimes we say a lot of words in our prayers, but our prayers do not have power because there's no significance behind those prayers. So the power of prayer, the persistence of prayer, is what Jesus is trying to talk to us about today. When he talks to us about this story, it's not that God is, is not willing to give to us certain things. He's saying, he's saying, sometimes we need to be more persistent. Sometimes we don't just pray one time and, and expect God to take care of us. Sometimes we really need prayer. I remember one of the earliest prayers that I ever prayed. I, was, I wasn't even a believer, but I was playing baseball. I was playing left field. And it was, it was, uh, it, it was, a, it was a slow game. And I was asking God, I said, please give me a shot out here in left field and make me dive for that ball. And when I dive for that ball, allow me to come up throwing and throw to second base and get that guy out at second base. I, I, I said, I just, wanna, I, just, I just wanna look good in front of everybody. So I, I said, Lord, give me, let me have this shot. So guess what? There was a shot out to left field. But guess what Bruce did with that shot? He missed the stinking ball the ball went to the fence, and I gave up a triple because I was so arrogant thinking, Lord, I want to do this. 
And when the time came, I was, Lord, come on, dude. I, I, I wanted a shot, and I couldn't deliver it. So I looked at that, and I said, sometimes prayer doesn't work. And sometimes when you want something and we pray for something, but it's not God's will, sometimes the prayer that we ask is not what God wants for our life. God doesn't want me to be arrogant and thinking what I can show off. God wants something bigger and deeper in our life than that. So let me read to you Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 13. And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend? And go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to my house on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut and my children are all in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though, he will arise, he will not arise and give him because he is his friend. And because his persistence, he will arise and give to him what he needs. This is not talking about God not giving to us. It's talking about the persistence in prayer. In the culture of the day, if somebody would come to visit, it would be cultural that you would have something to put in front of you. And somebody that he didn't know was coming to his house and he didn't have any food, so he went to his next door neighbor or one of his friends and he said, I need something from you. And in the culture of the day, they had a one bedroom house. So he would be in bed and all of his kids would be in that same area and somebody knocking on the door at midnight, waking up the kids and he struggled putting the kids to bed. He said, dude, just go away. I'll talk to you in the morning. But the guy kept on knocking. He kept on knocking, and finally, because of his persistence, the guy arose, probably just to get rid of him, but he arose and gave to him what he needed. And sometimes in our prayer life, that's exactly what God wants us to do. If we do not see something happening instantaneously, we don't just knock and say, hey, can you help me? God said sometimes that he wants us to hold on to him, and he wants us to pray. There are things within your life and things within my life that is something that's very important. And we need to seek after God's face and do what he's asked us to do. Verse 9. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and who seeks finds. And to whom who knocks, it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from a father among you, and you give him a stone, or if he asks for a fish, would you give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asked for an egg, would you not give him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit if you ask of him? So Jesus is saying, I'm talking to you about prayer. And I want to talk to you about some nuts and bolts of prayer. I want you to first ask yourself a question. How is your prayer life? And if you were honest with you, as I am with myself, you would say, probably I struggle. I, I'm not a prayer warrior. I only know one real prayer warrior, and he's sitting down here on the front row, and his name's Vernon Mace, and he's been our prayer warrior at our church for years. And I love him, and he, he's, my, he's my biggest fan, I think. So he, he prays for me all the time, and he prays for this church. But prayer is a struggle. Now, why is prayer a struggle? I think there's a few reasons why prayer is a struggle. Number one is we have to admit that I can't do this without God. Uh, I have struggles within my life. And sometimes we have sin within our life that keeps us from our prayer life. And keeps us from doing what God wants us to do. And sometimes it's our ego. And sometimes it's our time. And sometimes we get so busy doing so many different things that the prayer life or our spiritual life goes on the back burner because I'm busy doing the soccer, I'm busy doing this, I'm even doing church, and I don't have time to pray because I get so busy doing. And God is saying, there's nothing more important than what you can pray for. There's nothing more important than who you pray for. Uh, over the last two months, I've got hundreds of emails and texts and cards of people praying for me. And I promise you, if it wasn't for the prayers of people that are not looking at themselves, but looking at somebody else and praying for somebody else. It is mind-boggling what the power of prayer can do in somebody's life. So I want to say thank you for that. 
But what else it can do, it could change your perception of what God wants to do within your life. So often, we, we get in our minds what we want and we don't really care what God wants. Is Prayer, I believe, is a learned behavior. I believe that sometimes we don't pray because we've never been taught how to pray. Let me ask, anybody ever taken a class on prayer? You know, the, even the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Because it's not natural. It's not something I'm going to get up tomorrow morning and I'm going to start praying and I'm going to pray with my kids. I'm going to pray at the office. I'm going to pray for my meals. I'm just going to pray. It's not a natural thing. But it's something that the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. Your, my, the earliest prayer that I can remember, I had to write down so I don't forget it. You know, I've got some dementia going on, I think. It says, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Anybody ever prayed that one as a kid? It's probably one of the first prayers that your parents ever taught you how to pray. And this idea is not the repetition of the prayer. It's learning that prayer is important. And that God wants to hear us. As a child, repetition is fine. But as an adult, repetition is not prayer. What repetition is, is just words out of your mouth. But God wants to hear so much more than repetition. So let me give you a few points. The first thing is we need to pray with boldness. We need to pray with boldness. When I say boldness, when he says persistence, you need to really know what God wants for your life. And when you pray, you have to say, Lord, this is what I need. I need to expect you to work. I, 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 I'm struggling. And so often we pray for the mundane, but we don't pray for the important. And when we pray, we need to hold on to God and say, Lord, I can't do this without you. And I need to pray with boldness. I need to pray that God can deliver. Now, there, there are three lessons when you pray. Let me give you prayer class 101. Be specific in your prayer. I believe when we say pray for all of our missionaries. Oh, really? What, what, do you, what do you mean by pray for all of our missionaries? Pray, pray that my job goes well. Or pray, we pray in so generic terms that Jesus, he just wants us to be specific. We, we need to get down and say, this is what I need. Because as a father, I want my boy to ask me what he needs. Not, Lord, Dad, just pray that my school goes okay. Okay, but what about your classes? What about your grades? What about your homework? What are you learning? When, when we are a father, we want to know what we need to pray about. We need to lift somebody up in prayer. He doesn't deal in generalities. He deals in specifics. When, when you're broken and you're hurt, we have no problem with praying. Lord, I need you. But what about our everyday life? What about the specific things in your life? What is it in your life that's fallen apart? What is it that you know that you can't fix on your own? Now, I know you would say, well, God knows everything. So why do I ask God when he already knows everything within my life? And I want to turn that around as, as a dad. You may know what you need. But sometimes God wants us to talk to him because it allows us to put our faith and our confidence in what God can do within our life. So sometimes we just need to be specific. And then we need to be persistent. We need to be persistent. And we've heard stories and stories and stories of people being prayed for, for their salvation or for their health for many, many years. And sometimes the persistence of our prayer is so, so, so important. So when you're specific and then you're persistent, your prayer life changes. Now, Gayla, I'm going to say something here. I hope I don't offend you by any means. Uh, we were in Gayla's mother's hospital room uh, this week, and she passed away, and they did a memorial service this week. And on November 18th here at the church, they're going to do a memorial service for family and friends and for the church, for Gayla's mom. Been a member here for a long time. But when you look at a specific prayer or a persistent prayer, when we were there, sometimes my will... What I want is not what God wants. See, I could look at uh, Miss Grace and think, Lord, 
give her another 20 years or turn back the clock and allow her have a, a sharp mind, allow her to be healthy. But when I pray what I want and not what God wants, I get upset with God. But when you pray what God wants, you pray for a healing. And it may not be the healing here. It may be the healing in heaven. But when you look at somebody and they need prayer. When you go to a hospital room and somebody is struggling. And maybe a family member is struggling and they need prayer. You pray for them. And you pray for a specific way. So when we prayed for grace. We didn't pray for a healing down here. We didn't pray for another 20 years. We didn't pray for another two weeks. We prayed that the Lord would take her home. And the Lord would take her home in her sleep. And the Lord would take her home without any pain. And that night, the Lord did that. And sometimes prayer is something that we do not want. We do not want to lose mom. We don't want to lose dad. We don't want to lose our sister or our brother. But there are times in our prayer life that we can't do what we want. We have to do what God wants. Even Jesus said, not my will be done, but thy will be done, O Lord. And sometimes we get so selfish in our prayer life that we think it's what I want and what he says it's not about you. It's about what God wants to do through you. So we need to be specific and we need to be persistent. Never quit. You know, the old phrase that we've used here around time, the old push rule. P-U-S-H. Pray until something happens. Don't quit praying. Don't quit praying. Continue to pray. When we pray, God doesn't change his mind, but God changes your mind. And God can open doors that you cannot do yourself. Sometimes the request is right, and the timing is right, and we're not right with God. And when we look at what God can do through our life, there's some answers that we do. Sometimes uh, when we pray outside of God's will, he just says... No. Now, I know Garth Brooks' song, Thank God for Unanswered Prayers. Okay, anybody know that song? But there is no unanswered prayers. Zero. Every prayer that you utter up to God is answered. Now, you may not like the answer. And because he says no, you think that he does not answer your prayers. But when we look at what God wants within our life, every prayer is answered. Sometimes he says, no, no, you're, I'm not ready for this. It's not God's will. The word of God is opposite about it. You're praying for something that I cannot answer, so no. And then sometimes the answer is, slow down a little bit. You're not ready for that. If I, if I offered that prayer to you, and I answered that prayer that you're asking, you're not ready for that spiritually. You're not ready for that physically. And I can't answer that. So slow down and trust in me and be persistent in your prayer. So sometimes he says no, but sometimes he says slow. But then sometimes he says grow. Sometimes he says the timing is right. Everything looks good. But you're spiritually not ready for what you're asking for. And he says, here's what I need you to do. I need you to grow. I need you to get into the Bible. I need you to learn. I need you to understand what I want for you. So sometimes he says no. Sometimes he says slow down. Sometimes he says you need to grow. But there are times and the sweet times within your life when you are ready, when God's will is correct, and you're humble enough before God, he says go. He says yes. I want to give to you certain things. So don't get frustrated when we pray and it's not exactly what God wants for you and he says no. And don't get frustrated when he says slow down a little bit. Slow down a little bit. It's not, timing is not right. And sometimes what we really don't like is when he says, dude, you need to grow a little bit. You need to learn. You need to understand what the Bible says. You need to understand my will. And the only way that you're going to know my will is get into the word of God. And sometimes we ask God as a, as a Christmas uh, Santa Claus, gimme, 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 gimme. And Jesus is not a Santa Claus. He wants us to grow. And sometimes he says, once you've grown, and once you understand what my will is, and once you're where you need to be, I can give to you and I can answer your prayers and we can go forward. So, specific, be persistent, and then be expectant. Expect God to work. It doesn't do you any good to pray and say, God won't answer that prayer. So when we're persistent and we're expectant and we say, Lord, I need you to do this, 
And when we ask God to, that this is going to happen, we expect God to work. Why would you pray if you didn't believe in God? Why would you pray if you don't think God can deliver the goods? When you know it's in God's will and you know this is what God wants for you, you can bow your head before God in a persistent, in a, in a specific way, in an expectant way, and ask God to answer your prayers. There's nothing sweeter than going into a hospital room or praying over a couple that uh, are struggling. And you lay your hands on them and you pray for them. And you see God work within their life. Because when you pray, you don't say, Lord, I hope you will do this. You're asking God to do supernatural things within somebody's life. Can I do it? No. Can they do it? No. But when we ask God to change somebody's heart, we ask God to work within somebody's life, expectancy is I can do this because God is on my side. And when God is on my side, everything changes. So the second point is pray for an action plan. Pray with an action plan. And he gives us this action plan in verse 9. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Seeks, finds. And who knocks, it will be opened. And the word is a continual word. It's not you ask one time. It's not that you seek one time. It's not that you knock on the door one time. It is, I, I need this. And I'm going to ask God for this. And God is going to grant this with expectancy. I know that if I ask God and I seek after God and I knock on doors, God will open those doors. The, the illustration that we can use to open the door here is this. If you needed a job and you started asking people, do you know who's hiring? Yeah, they're hiring over here. And so you fill out an application. You seek after that. You, you say, okay, I'm, I, I know they're hiring, so I'm going to go over there. I'm going to fill out a job application. I'm going to search after what's taking place. But if you don't hear anything, you say, well, I guess they didn't want me. You're not knocking. And some oftentimes that we seek after God and we ask God, but we don't knock on doors. And if we don't get one job, what we sometimes do is say, you know what, it's not worth it. We need to knock on many doors. And when God is answering questions for you and needs for you, and we ask God, we seek after God, and we knock on doors, it is the formula for prayer. So often, when we ask God, we just say, Lord, I need something. The Bible says you have not, because what? You ask not. And if you're not asking God, God is saying, I, I want to give you all kinds of different things, but... I can't give it to you unless you are ready for it and you seek after it and you knock after it. It's like a pastor that, that passed away. And, uh, and uh, Peter took him up to the gates and started showing him around heaven. And there was this gigantic warehouse in heaven. And, and uh, I'm going to use um, Billy Graham. Everybody knows who Billy Graham is. Billy Graham passed away and uh, walked up there and he said, he said uh, my name is on this warehouse. And it must be very important that you put my name on this warehouse in heaven. So, uh, and Peter says, you don't want to go in there. He goes, this, this is my warehouse. Of course I want to go in there. He goes, okay. So they walked into the warehouse that had Billy Graham's across the front of it. And he started seeing shelves after shelves after shelves of boxes with names on those boxes. And uh, Billy Graham says, what are all these? And he said, these are the blessings that God wanted to give to you and to bless your life with if only you would have asked. And we ask not, so we receive not. But the opposite, if we ask and we understand it's in God's will, we can receive every blessing that God wants us to have. So we have to ask, we have to search, and we have to knock. And when we do that, we know that God can take care of of every aspect of our life. James 1.5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. If you lack wisdom, if you need something, ask of God, and he will give it to you. When he gives it to you, everything falls into place. So that's what God wants to do within your life. So when you ask 
A-S-K. You ask, you seek, and you knock. Finally, Jesus is teaching us to do one more thing. According to his goodness, we should ask. According to his goodness. Where are you struggling? What have you prayed for lately? And when you pray, how are you praying? Are we praying in a mindset that, oh, I'm putting in my dues. I told somebody I'd pray for them. Or when we pray with somebody, is it expecting God to change their life? The goodness of God, as a good father would do certain things for their son, how much more do you think our heavenly father wants to do for us? But so often, we go through the motions of prayer. We may come to the altar or we may kneel beside our bed and we go through the same old ritual every night and pray for the same old things and fall asleep while we're praying and we wake up, oh, I just fell apart. But prayer is this. It's communion between you and God. It's just talking. I heard a story of a, of a man that uh, was about ready to die. And a preacher came by his house and, and uh, said, uh, um, how you doing? Can I pray with you? And he goes, he goes you know, that's, that's a request. Can you pray for me? I, I'm having a hard time with prayer. And the preacher says, okay, can I give you an illustration? He said, you're just talking to God. He said, I just, I have a hard time with that. And he goes, he goes here's, here's the exercise that you need to give. You just need to, you're in your room. You're, you're, you don't get out. Put an empty chair beside the bed. And when you're praying, don't close your eyes. Look at the chair. And imagine Jesus being in that chair. Because prayer is... It's not something, oh, you can't use your King James voice and say all these big words. Prayer is just talking. It's as I was just talking to Pastor Al in his office. We just talk. We talk back and forth. And God speaks to us through his word and through his prayer. And we speak to God. So when we're talking, all we have to do is look at what Jesus wants to do for us. A few weeks later... Or, no, I'm sorry. The, the dad says, but don't tell my daughter this because if she thinks I'm sitting here talking to a chair, she's going to think I'm crazy and she's going to put me in a Lulu farm. And he goes, he goes, don't worry about that. A few weeks later, the daughter calls the preacher and says, hey, your, uh, dad just died and uh, we were wanting to sit down a time with you to meet about the funeral. And, he goes, and she, goes, she goes, but something was really weird. He died sitting on his bed with his head on the armrest of an empty chair. So when he was praying, he put his confidence in Jesus. So whatever you need as a tool, whatever you need to pray, whether it's, a, whether it's an empty chair, or whether it's a prayer list, or whether it's at the altar, when you pray with expectancy that God can answer your prayers, whatever tool that you need, Make sure that you give God the opportunity to do exactly what he asked you to do. He wants to meet our spiritual needs. He wants to meet our physical needs. When you look at what the needs that you have, he wants to meet them. And he, and he gave this list, whether, if your son would come to you and, and he needed something, would he give you a stone or would he give you a scorpion or would he give you a serpent? He goes, no, no, no. A good dad would not do that. A good dad would give to him the bread. He'd give to him what he needs. As a father, when somebody comes to us, we try to help them out. And he says, you being evil, in other words, have a sin nature, you want to do good things for your sin. How much more do you think the heavenly father wants to give to you? And he wants to meet you in two different areas. He does want to meet your physical needs. He does want to help you in your finances. He does want to help you at your job. But that's not the major point. We are not a prosperity gospel church. You pray these things and he's going to give you a million dollars. You know, that just causes more problems. But what he wants to do, he wants to meet your physical needs. Your physical needs, spiritual needs. 
What's the spiritual needs? And the end of the scripture says, he's going to give to you the Holy Spirit. Now, why the Holy Spirit? Because when you pray, and when you're struggling, we think physical. We think emotional. We think egotistical. But when we pray, and he says, I'm going to give to you the Holy Spirit. And when we pray for God to give to us the Holy Spirit, when we give our life to Christ and the Holy Spirit dwells within our life, the Holy Spirit is enacted. And what happens is peace, love, security, happiness, forgiveness takes place. So when we're struggling and we need God to answer a prayer, it's not about, Lord, give me a million dollars. It's, Lord, give me the patience that I need to have. Give me the peace that passeth all understanding. It's when somebody dies, Lord, give me that comfort. And when you ask God for the peace and forgiveness and the comfort, when something does take place, the Holy Spirit wraps his arms around you. And he gives to you the things that you can't do for yourself. You can't just stand up and say, nothing's bothering me. I'm just frustrated. No, no. We stand up and say, Lord, I need your help. And that's what prayer does. It changes our life. And prayer is something just asking God. Ask, search, and knock. He is going to open a door physically and spiritually. So, if we didn't take a class, and we don't know how to pray, it'd be the same thing as my 16-year-old boy want to drive. And I, I just bought this brand new convertible. Red convertible bucket seats. Beautiful car. And I said, son, have fun. And threw him the keys to the car. He's never been behind the wheel before. He's never, he doesn't know the rules of the road. He just watched me drive. Am I stupid enough to give my boy that car? I hope not. And I hope you're not either. Because in driving... And in prayer, the disciples said, teach me to pray. I have to teach my boy how to drive. I had to make sure he went through driver's ed. Because I want him to be safe. In our prayer life, it's teach me to pray. And how do we learn how to pray? Is humbly go before God and say, Lord, I don't know. But I need you. And allow God to start answering doors for you. You ask. You seek. And you knock. He wants to do two major things within your life. He wants to help you physically. With your job. With your finances. And with your health. But more important than your job. Your finances and your health. He wants to help you spiritually. Because multiple times. Many, many, many times. Somebody has said this one thing to me. And it was said this week. I couldn't go through this without the Lord. In other words, what they're saying is the Holy Spirit is helping me right now. I could ask God all kinds of different things. And he could have done all kinds of different things. But in the midst of calamity, in the midst of our fears, in the midst of our issues, I need God. And Jesus is saying, when you pray, ask God. Seek after him and knock on doors. And the greatest thing that he wants to do is he wants to come around inside you and give to you the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And one of the things the Holy Spirit does, he forgives. He comforts. He encourages. He brings to our mind the things that we want and the things that we should say. So the greatest joy that we could have in our prayer life is knowing that the Holy Spirit of God lives within us. We gain that access to the Holy Spirit the moment that we gave our life to Christ. And then when you struggle, when you come to the altar, when you pray for your family, you pray for your job, when you pray for your health, you have a bigger power than you could ever comprehend. And that power is part of the triune Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit that lives within your heart. And you say, I don't know how to pray. He said he's going to give to you the utterance of the Holy Spirit to offer up our worship and offer up our prayers unto God. 
You say, I just don't know how to do it. Well, let me ask you this. We may not know how, but just because you don't know how doesn't give you a reason not to. Well, I don't know how to pray. How we pray is fall on our knees before God and say, Lord, I need you. Lord, give to me a peace within my life. I need you to give to me the understanding. I'm going to ask you. And then after I ask you, I'm going to search of what I need to do. You don't just say, Lord, I need a better marriage. But yet you don't change anything about your marriage. Lord, I need a better job, but you don't do better at your job. You ask God. You seek after him. You seek after knowledge. And then you knock on doors. When we're praying, we just say, Lord, I just need you to help me. I'm going to talk to you as your friend. I know that you're my savior. I know that you died on the cross for my sins. I know that I can't go to heaven without you. But today, I know that's tomorrow. That's when I die. But today, I need you. And what we have to do is we have to humbly come before him and admit, I can't do this on my own. Ask, seek, and knock. And when you ask God and you seek after him and you knock on doors, God can do great things within your life. So, what is prayer? Simply. Prayer is asking God to do things with you, through you, and for you that you can't do on your own. And sometimes we try to do our spiritual life on our own. We try to read, we try to pray, we try to minister on our own. But until we ask God and seek after God's wisdom and knock on doors of opportunity, our prayer life is just words. We're just very out there. And he said, be specific. Be persistent. And expect great things from God. And the church, the church is called a house of, you may know what? A house of prayer. The Bible doesn't call the church a house of worship. Songs. The Bible doesn't call the house a house of preaching. The Bible calls the house of God the house of prayer. And why is that? Is because until we put God where he needs to be in my life and in your life, it's just songs that we sing. It's just words that we say. But when we put God where he needs to be within our heart, then the church is a house of prayer. It means the Holy Spirit of God changes our life. So when we think about what the Holy Spirit can do, I want you to think about this. What can the Holy Spirit do for you? Well, the Holy Spirit does something that's unbelievable. When we ask God to bless us, we ask God to work within our homes and work within our jobs and work within our finances. And we ask the Holy Spirit to take residence and to work within our life. It doesn't change anything about us. What it does, it unleashes the power of the Holy Spirit within our life. We're not going to speak different. We're not going to act different. We're not going to do things different. But what happens is the Holy Spirit enables things to take place within our life. He allows us to speak where people can see Christ. Allows us to live a way that God can be glorified and honored. So when we ask the Holy Spirit to take residence within our life, it's not something that we have to do an outward expression of the power of the Holy Spirit. It's that we allow the Holy Spirit to do things through us, for us. And when the power and the blessing of the Holy Spirit takes place within your life. People around you will take notice. Things will be done and people will be saved. And things will have happen in your life. Not because of anything else that you've done. It's just that the Holy Spirit uses you. Now. When you're struggling. In your home. Your health. Your finances. At work. And even in your spiritual life. There's only one way to change it. And it's not coming into my office for counseling. Get on your knees and ask God to change your life. Ask God. Seek after Him. Knock on opportunities. And God 
can do great things. Sometimes I wonder about this. I'm just going to be vulnerable for a couple seconds. Sometimes I wonder why our altars at church are not used. Because if, if you're struggling at home, if you're struggling at work, if you're struggling in your finances, you're struggling with your kids, are you going to fix it? If you were going to fix it, you'd already been fixed. But the only way that your life is going to change is not on more things that you've done and we've done wrong. It's asking God to change it through prayer and allowing the Holy Spirit to fix their life and to change their heart. And when the Holy Spirit works through you, it can work in their life. So prayer is the most powerful tool that you have. It's not your intellect and it's not your resources. It's not anything that you have other than the power of the Holy Spirit being impacted and empowered by your prayer life. So I want to challenge you. Where are you struggling? And where do you need help? And if you can be honest with God and say, I can't do this on my own. I stink at this. And Jesus puts a smile on his face and says, I know, dude. I've been watching you for the last 54 years. I know that you struggle. Now that you've talked to me, let me take over. And when he takes over, it changes everything about what you stink at. Because he starts working within your life. Don't expect God to do great things in your life until you ask God to do great things in your life. When you ask him, we have not because we ask not. And he that asks receives. So when we ask God, he's saying, okay, now you're on the right path. Prayer is just talking to God. And talking to God allows the Holy Spirit to be interacting within your life to change the things that God wants within your life.